welcome to the Naughty Child Podcast. With me, Richard. And me, Polly. I'm the dad. And I'm the daughter. I did everything before I leave. I need to find that bag of McCoy's. Alex Hartley took us off air in Brighton earlier this year. I'm a huge fan of Pepper. We thought we were really funny. Bobby, I'm doing a <laughs> podcast, man. Come on. <laughs> well, my dog is now called Jimmy Anderson. Oh, well, Manchester Originals aren't through to the Eliminators, so I've got to change that to yeah. Do you cook French food? Like, do you cook frog legs and snails? <laughs> oh, I just locked myself in a procedure room. That Sophie Eccleston's the worst. It's like having a child with you when she's on tour. I don't know whether it shows something about me or whether it just shows I'm a little bit stupid. Polly, it's the Christmas special. It's the Christmas special, but I don't know how much Christmas stuff we have to chat about because our interview has nothing to do with Christmas. You mean we didn't get to ask them what their favourite bit of Christmas dinner well, was this year? ever since Liberty Heat was like, oh, I don't really like Christmas, I've been a little bit traumatised and haven't ever wanted to ask anyone again. Liberty Heat has ruined Christmas for us. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, you took it a step. The, the, you took it to the next level, yeah, no, no, no. Um, no, we haven't actually done Christmassy stuff. I don't feel very Christmassy. I, I always peak too soon. And I think I peaked probably early November. Is it because you've been watching Muppet Christmas Carol and Nativity no, no, the movie right, I, throughout the whole I of the year? I have not watched Muppet Christmas Carol since about May. So it's definitely not that. Um, I did have Chris, like a Christmas couple of days in Manchester before I came back. Uh-huh. Um, so maybe I felt quite Christmassy then. But I'm sat, I'm writing essays. Like, I don't feel Christmassy yet, so, yeah. You're writing essays? Well, one essay. Wow. <laughs> I know, hard work. Um, but it's all right. We'll, we'll get there. Well, school is still going on for me. I've, oh, no. We're recording on a Thursday night. I've still got to go back in tomorrow on Friday, the 22nd of December. I don't think I've ever had to go into school on that date before. I know it's really, really late because some schools finish on the 15th, but we'll go back a week earlier. Mm. But it does mean you have the first week of January completely off, Which including your, well, you always have your birthday off, but yeah, you know. I am looking forward to it. Yes. Yeah, that would be nice. Um, so we will have a break from the podcast over the next few weeks and we'll be back early new year. We'll probably do kind of a bit of review of the year. I think that would be good to do. Yes. Yes. Um, because yeah, it's been a busy year. There's been a lot going on and I kind of forget that a lot of different things happened in 2023 because it does feel like a long time ago. Um, but in terms of cricket that's going on at the moment, there's been a bit of stuff to do with contracts. So I know Lizzie Scott has signed her first contract with the Northern Diamonds. I saw that. Which yes. is very exciting. Um, and Katie Levick has committed to two more years, I believe, with the Diamonds. So that's again exciting. Now, did I see that Maddie Ward has moved to the Diamonds. Yeah, so Maddie Ward has had a successful trial with the Diamonds Academy. So is playing with them. So she was previously in the Blaze Academy. So another of those under 19s. Um, and in fact, that is a beautiful segue to chat about the European T10 because Maddie Ward is part of the team who's playing for England 11 out in Spain. So it's a really interesting tournament because T10 cricket is not really a thing uh the england 11 side is also not really a thing but uh france were withdrawn from the tournament as i think we mentioned a couple of weeks ago and this england 11 have replaced it so it's it's a mix of players that play for their region so for example ria fackrell beth and ellis but also mixed in with a couple of the regional academy players so maddie ward for one mm -hmm. um so it's quite interesting to see how they're getting along because a lot of them aren't on full-time pro contracts they're on these kind of the pay to play sort of thing but the timing of it is perfect for people like that well isn't it? exactly yeah and i think in terms of the standard it's been relatively balanced i would say because you've got the netherlands who are very strong and they they don't have the likes of uh stair Callis, who of course is one of their top players um but they've been going along nicely and then yesterday or by the time this is out be a couple of days ago Italy beat the England eleven, so Whoa. which was I think was a bit of a shock, but at the same time, kind of shows the progression of European cricket. And friend of the pod, Regina was playing. Regina was playing. In fact, um, we need to mention Italy's game against the Netherlands because Italy have started. 
we we mentioned a couple of weeks ago against about Vanuatu and Papua New Guinea becoming uh, the biggest rivals in women's <laughs> cricket. But actually, I think the Netherlands and Italy could be coming along nicely because in a pre, I think it was the tournament in the summer for the qualifiers. Um, it came down to the wire, and um, the exact same thing happened this time. So I think they needed seven from the final ball. Regina was on strike, managed to get it for four. It was close to a six, though. Mm. It was really close to the boundary. Um, uh, what I saw was that if it had been a six, it had mm. gone for it to a tie, it would not have been a super over. It mm. would have been the golden ball. I know. Which it's... is, they bowl it, and you have to hit two to win. I know. Imagine being the person to have to bowl that. Because with a super over, I guess there's a bit more, I mean, there's not really room for error. But there's a little bit more leeway. But the golden ball, all that pressure. Um, so really interesting. I mean, England 11, we need to say these are not caps that they're winning. No. It's no. not an official ECB England no, team. They're not in the England kit or anything. They've got a different logo and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're known as the England 11. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of, I'm sure the first ever Women's World Cup, I could be wrong. I'm sure there was a second England side. Okay. It's like a young England. Yes. Or right. right. when I did my EPQ research, there was a young England team somewhere else, and that seems to yes. be. I mean, that potentially could have been more England A, but it's mm-hmm. kind of like an unaffiliated yes. team, like squad of players. Um, but that's been interesting to follow. I think Austria also in there, and Spain. Yes. Um, so yeah, interesting to see the cricket from there, and there seems to be a bit of sun. Oh, it's been really warm in Spain, apparently. Really? Yeah. So I was talking to a colleague who's from Spain yeah. and is going over there for Christmas. Mm-hmm. And um, she was saying her mother had been complaining about the cold, saying it's <laughs> gone down to 25 degrees. Oh, what burden. 25 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> oh, that's very good. Now, we haven't spoken for that long, but I don't really know what other things we need to chat about in the cricket world. Uh, well, yeah, the t- test match is all done and dusted, oh, wasn't yeah. it? Well, I mean, Australia are playing India at the moment in the test match. Oh, yes, I haven't so picked up on what happened today. I haven't followed very much. I know Lauren Cheetle made her test debut for Australia, Ooh. which is nice. Um, but other than that, I haven't really followed. I think it'll be interesting to see how that game goes. We mentioned in last week as well, just in terms of were England dire or... Yes, they were. Well, yes, they, that's <laughs> yeah. true. But like... It, is, is it just one factor or actually will Australia struggle against India sort of thing? Because, I mean, Australia, you think best in the world. How will yes. they fare kind of thing? My prediction would be that Australia will do better than England. Oh, but definitely. I, but I think I think, think they India? will struggle to, to beat India in India. Okay. I mean, maybe. Fair enough. Um, in fact, just latest up-to-date score, <laughs> Australia were bowled out for 219. India, Ooh. 98 for one at the close. Um, Interesting. Yes. So, not looking good for Australia. No. Tyler McGrath got 50. Nice. So, so yeah, but not the disgrace that England no, got. No, no, no. They, no, got, they got at least 80 more runs than England got. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Shall we introduce our guest for this week? Yes. Kane Hamilton Boyle was someone who it was really interesting to talk to because we've spoken to so many players, but very few backroom stuff Mm. in the history of our podcast. And he, it felt like he filled in a lot of the gaps in my knowledge of Mm. what it actually is to be a professional cricketer. Yeah, because I think we get one side of it. Mm -hmm. And I think actually, particularly with uh, because he works a lot with the academies. We, we, we should say this, we didn't say this. Um, he's the regional talent manager for the Blaze. Mm-hmm. And so his role is working with the academy and also with senior players and kind of bridging that gap and bringing these players through into professionalism. And given where the women's game is regionally at the moment in terms of professionalism, that's quite an interesting job to have mm-hmm. because it presents a lot of challenges. Um and I think with it getting more professional, there'll be more challenges because there are fewer contracts in the sense that people will, will stay in their contracts. Um, so, yeah, very, very interesting. Um, and we did we did give him a bit of a hard time. We gave him a bit of a grilling with some questions. So, um, but no, he gave us some very good answers. So enjoy our chat with Kane.
So to start, how did you first get involved with cricket? Like, was this an interest as a child or did, did it come later in life? It came a lot later than I think a lot of people expect. So no one in my family has played, likes cricket. Um, I didn't play until I was 13, actually. And it was only really because one of my friends from when I was growing up, they were short of a player in a, in a team and um, decided to go. I'd always been either football, rugby, um, growing up in a, in a family where my dad was massively rugby oriented and obviously growing up with, with friends, they, they all loved football. So it yeah, kind of fell into it weirdly. And um, as cricket does, it kind of grabs a hold of you all of your time and um, it swallows your whole. So yeah, I was kind of hooked from then. And I guess throughout growing up uh, playing cricket, I'd, developed quite a love for the game and trolled for the county a couple of times but playing I don't think was ever really number one for me and I quite quickly got into coaching so I think I was coaching when I was about 17 and that kind of be the start of start of the journey to now I suppose. So how do you go from being a 17 year old to doing a bit of coaching at your local club into you know being a someone who's employed full-time working in the professional game? Uh, a lot of work a lot of hours I think you've got to give time for free. Uh, you've, you've got to be around good people, and you've got to, you've got to push yourself into different opportunities and expose yourself to different things. Uh, I think I got told something a long time ago that if you do the same experience over and over, you have one year of experience. If you do the same thing, if you do different things a load of times, you'll have a number of different experiences over a number of different uh, years, and that will kind of sculpt you to create what you think your philosophy is and progress you through through your career so I guess that's kind of been my my goal is to throw myself into a number of different experiences and try and push myself to to meet new people along the way and I've definitely met some, some great people. So in terms of qualifications you know did you do go down the A level and degree route or did you uh, do cricket based qualifications or was it a mixture of all of those things? Did A levels wasn't really sure what I wanted to do um, as anyone at that age did business, did English, and I think I did um did I did do sport at, at A levels, and then I went to university fairly locally in in, in Bedfordshire, um, and I did sports science and coaching. So I guess that kind of I probably made my mind up a little bit at that point uh, that that was going to be the the route that I wanted to go down and explore that. Yeah, obviously ECB offer a, a number of, of great courses, and I'm currently doing the level four, which is which is kind of blown my mind a little bit um, we had psychology a couple of weeks ago and yeah the first day was 10 till 7 and it was just you know it was a heavy day but it was it's been great learning and I think it's, it's that same thread of I've learned a lot through the informal stuff as well um, so like through speaking to people through asking people to give me feedback on my coaching and, and I guess players are kind of the biggest guide so I think you, you, you know you go through all of the formal structure but it's the informal bits that latch to it that kind of give you the learning and, and the formal stuff for me is a lot about self-reflection and kind of sculpting how I want to deliver and, and the kind of coach that I am. What's it like moving into the professional game when you've coached at grassroots level where, I mean, it does matter to the people playing grassroots cricket, but, you know, it's not the be all and end all. Then you come into the professional game and, and they're really crucial people who this is their job. How does that differ for you as a coach? Uh, I guess the motivation is different for the players. So you've probably got to understand that the motivation of, uh, eight-year-old going to going to all stars is you know primarily to enjoy the game to have some fun. So I guess for me, if I'm if I'm going very heavy technical to an eight-year-old trying to just whack a few out of the park and enjoy the time with 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 their mates, I think it's it's a lot different to maybe an eighteen-year-old in in an academy who's pushing for a, for a pro contract. So I think from from that perspective, understanding the motivation and almost you know just empathising with with the players in in that sense of you know, where are you at? What are your aspirations? Where do you want to get to? And that kind of sculpts, I guess, the, the beginning of the relationship um, with the players that you work with. So you're a, a senior regional talent manager now. Now, I, I bet when you're growing up and people ask you what you wanted to be, you probably didn't say that. So how how do you get into being a senior regional, ta regional talent manager? Uh, luck. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. You, you have to hit a lot of lucky streaks along the way. And I think you know, from, from that point where I was 17, 18, um, there was a lot of really good people around me that, that gave me opportunities to work within different spaces. So, you know, I was coaching county age group cricket um, probably from the time I was about 18, 19, 20 and, and doing that part-time, sort of going in, watching sessions, getting around sessions and 
and seeing how things were done from a county age group perspective. And through that, weirdly, actually, um, Matt Guesty, who is is currently our our head coach, and um, he did a little bit of mentoring with me, which you know was a, was a slice of luck. And from that, it snowballed. I I just asked him. I said, "Can I can I come up and watch some of the RDC stuff that's going on in in Loughborough?" And he said, "Yeah, come along." Um, I was just expected to sort of stand at the back of the hall and and watch as everything was going on, and he sort of chucked me a mitt, and <laughs> he was like, "Right, you're in." Um, so kind of got got stuck in there, and then yeah, again, I guess that kind of opened my eyes up to to the world of of sort of performance sport and and really progressing my career. And yeah, like I say, luck's probably been the the biggest factor for me of meeting good people along the way, throwing yourself into opportunities, and it comes back to that. I think you've got to take every opportunity you get given you don't know what alleyway it might lead down and you know obviously had that mentorship from Guesty quite early on in my career and kind of comes full circle and now working with him at the Blazers you know obviously got a great relationship with him um it's you know, it's been a it's been a lucky one but opportunities are the key so I guess what what you do at the moment like this is what I I would perceive your role as being is working with the youngsters who are on the verge of you know looking to get a professional contract sort of at that academy level but also identifying people in the age groups below who can who can make that step up so how practically do you actually do that uh yeah you're exactly right um we've got a pretty robust player identification process that we go through so to to run you through it in in, in short terms we kind of have a number of meetings which i chair um so regional advisory group meetings which will be with all of the county pathway leads so we'll, we'll get together in in a room and we'll ask those guys for their nominations of, of players we've obviously got an idea of players within the region but those guys are incredibly useful to us um they obviously know what's coming through they know the the next players who are, who are going to be coming off of sort of under 13 level which would be where we would start to look so we create a long list of players we then sort of filter that through a number of different avenues so either scouting either informal formal scouting reports we've got a number of independent scouts that, that we use across across the season um, and as the season goes on we then move into sort of like an observation phase so we'll have players shortlisted for observation who will come and play sort of best be best if you, if you will um, fixtures and from that point we'll we'll make a make a view on on selection for players to come into a, into our program but then as you say there's there's then the whole heap of stuff that goes from the point you get selected to either an EPP or an academy to you know working really really hard and you know, I think the transition rates this year was were eight percent of players went from a regional academy into a into a pro environment so you know the the numbers are pretty slim and that's that's come down year on year I think it was somewhere around eighteen percent nineteen percent the year prior and as the game as the game develops even further and, and becomes quite you know that it becomes more professionalized players are players are going to find it pretty tough to get into there so i guess that would be the the primary step of it but i guess to to explore that a little bit further we we have to we have to face up to that and, and show the players that it it isn't just a linear journey come on you know skyrocket into that environment and you're, you're an academy player you're going to get a pro contract so we we have to frame that really really clearly at the start of the journey that this isn't this isn't going to be a career for everybody but if we can if we can help you along your journey, you have a great time and you know, you gain some some skills from within the sport and, and as a person, you know, that's that's our goal as as an academy, I suppose. I mean, that must be so difficult managing those expectations. And but but then also, I mean the, the, the stats you gave, eight percent. So that's one in twelve, essentially, isn't it? So if you've got a an age group just below professional level of a first eleven. It's possible that one of them might make it. I mean that that's really really slim chances, isn't it? So how how do you manage the disappointment that goes along with that? Uh, be honest, give regular updates. You've got to engage parents really well, and I like to give chapter headings of the book to the parents. They don't necessarily need the full story. That's what the player will have. Um, the parents are a, a crucial one. We do regular review meetings, so we'll have four formal reviews or sit downs that, that we hold annually um, and those are good checkpoints for us to almost goal set um, analyze and, and review where where players are at are heading and, and what that looks like it also gives us the ability to open up as a staff group what opportunities players might need to realize some of those bits so if we're saying to a, to a top order batter that she needs to go out and score 
a load of runs and we bat a seven all season, we've probably not not done our job very well there. Um, so it has to be relevant to the player. You've got to come at it from a lens of, of empathy. You've got to understand that the players are human. They have lofty goals and expectations. And I think, coming back to the honesty bit, I think it's cruel to string players along. I think in deselection, it's obviously it's the, it's the worst part of the job. And you know, I've, over the first two years within this programme, I think I've had to deselect 11 players. And I guess the, the challenge within that is that has to sit with me and you know I take full accountability and responsibility for for that part of the process. But there's a lot that goes in behind the scenes. So I obviously source information from a variety of different people through the staff that work with us, through the scouting network, um, through the head coach, because we have to look at the future needs of, of the programme and, and what the pro environment needs moving forward. But like I say, in, in the in the deselection or selection meeting, I think it's just you, you've got to give the player the information and you've got to let them let them heal essentially. Um, in, in my perspective, you can't you can't string it along. There's no point trying to make the player feel better about the decision. I think you've just got to deliver the hammer blow, and you'd hope that the experience before that they've had a great time. You know, they've built great relationships within the space. They're gonna feel disappointed at the end of it, but the hope is that after that healing process, they look back and they go, Do you know what? Actually, you know, I had a great time. I really, really enjoyed it. They they pushed me really hard, but I I just wasn't at the level um, to progress. I guess that would be my my ethos on it but like I say it's never easy yeah it's reassuring to hear that there are kind of good systems in place because you hear horror stories it tends to be from kind of men's Premier League academies where these boys have worked their entire life and this is everything to them and then they get dropped and their life falls apart sort of thing um but kind of on a similar note to that how do you work with these players when they're still in education because a lot of them will be aspiring to a career in cricket and naturally that's all they want to do but at the same time, they might be 15, 16, 17 and still very much in education and having to go to school and get those qualifications if, if cricket doesn't work out. Yeah, uh, school has to take priority. I think I, I laugh because some of the girls on the academy have an unbelievable amount of stakeholdership. So you think about, I'll give a couple of examples. So Flora and Annie last year, who are on our academy, would um, have played under 15 age group, club, county, school. Um, they'd have played under 18 club, county, school they'd have played potentially women's county which Flora did um, last year they'll be then playing regional academy cricket so already I've, I've listed off a number of environments without listing club women um, so there's there's a lot of stakeholdership in it and I guess like balancing that side of it we, you know, we try and do our best with it but I think sometimes you just have to take the players lead and that's sort of part of growing as a player in in an age group system where there are a lot of demands, a lot of people pulling you in different directions. So from our perspective, the player probably needs to needs to take the lead on that. And that for me is is the form forming of ownership. Obviously the priority is always the academical side and you know, we we try and limit the amount of stuff that we do through heavy exam phases or if we are going to play fixtures, we signpost pretty clearly to the players that it's completely up to them if if they play or if they don't, and none of that impacts selection, um, which we'll obviously go through this year. We've got a lot of girls in exam years, so it's kind of balancing that. And I guess touching on that, the the pressures that exam causes and the stress that it causes around training. You know, we've just had a round of mocks for the GCSE stuff, and you know, the under sixteen girls. I've I've not I've not experienced much like it in the last few weeks, and there's that side of it when you're training. It's knowing when to dial things up and when to dial things back and, and maybe just having a conversation with a player. We're, we're really blessed that we've got a great sports science and medicine team that do a lot of monitoring with the players and dress comes up obviously around pretty crucial times. So it's, it's nice when, when Ros or Sharpie kind of get into my ear and say, or oh, she's she's had high stress for the whole week, maybe <laughs> maybe don't go and try and bump her and, <laughs> and take her head off today. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question there, but in a roundabout way, education is the key for us and, and the cricket revolves around that. That's good. That's the right answer. And and uh, yeah. normally it's me that gets asked the <laughs> education question as well. But I, I came so, in quickly. <laughs> so I deeply value education. I, I can, so I I can to, tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, one of the things that interests me, because we've interviewed a, a huge proportion, actually, of the professional cricketers in the women's game at the moment, so a number of the Blaze players um, who are absolutely lovely. Um, but lots of them have got very similar stories. 
So they're from quite similar backgrounds. They're from families who, you know, their brothers played, their parents played, they're part of the local cricket club and that sort of thing. So I'm just wondering what is happening at the Blaze and what within your role you're doing to diversify the type of people you're getting in to actually progress onto professional cricket? I, I don't think there's ever really one way you can go down it. I think you, you deal with the crop of players that, that come through and clearly we're going to, we're going to pick the best best possible players to go on and, and play professional cricket, which is always our, our intention. But I think for me, personality is the big one. And we want to pick players with personality and I think with talent programmes, they do a really good job of absolutely ruining people's personalities. Um, get into a box, do this, do that. You know, you have to behave this way. You have to, these, these are the values of the place that we're in. So you have to, come into that so we've we've developed the code and they're quite generic taglines so for example we've got do good things um messy bedroom tidy lounge so they're things that everybody can relate to and i think just understanding that personality is number one and is a player behaving in a certain way versus is that their character would be one for me so i think it's easy to go this player's character is x they're disorganised, they're this. And actually, that might just be a behaviour on a week where they've got a lot on and they've turned up two minutes late to training and actually their parents have driven them there because their parents have finished late at work. I think for me, personality is a really key one and actually stamping your personality on the game. We all look at the best entertainers. You know, Tammy Beaumont would be a great example of somebody who's unbelievably confident in her ability. And you can see she loves the show. She loves being in front of people at Trent Bridge. She loves being the centre of attention and people looking at her and going, oh, that's Tammy Beaumont. And she said that herself. But I guess just in terms of like the ID stuff that, that we do, we work really closely with the counties to make sure that those guys are identifying an, an appropriate number of players, one, at, at the young young age groups. And you know, they're doing a great job of that. Um, the opportunities that, that are going on, and there's a, there's a lot going on, forwards in the younger age groups with county age group cricket moving forward so there'll be almost like double the the opportunity to Derbyshire a, a trial in a, a pretty cool innovation where everything's going to be intra uh, in in under 11 so what that would look like would be they would play internal fixtures against each other in the under 11 so instead of picking you know a performance squad at under 11 which you know, is there such a thing um they would pick I don't know, 30 to 40 players in, in under 11s and they would constantly play against each other. So instead of in a game, you pick your your performance side of 12 players to go and play against whoever. You get two opening batters, two opening bowlers. Well, actually, they're saying, well, why can't we have four opening batters, four opening bowlers? So you end up developing more players in 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 different opportunities per game, um, which I think, you know, it'd be great to, to see what comes of that. And that that would certainly be something that we're keeping an eye on um, from a from an identification perspective and to, I guess, like you say, diversify the amount of players that are coming into the game and, and getting opportunities at different different phases. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I was thinking particularly about ethnic diversity as well. So within Nottingham and within Derby, you've got quite large ethnic communities which are not being completely represented. I mean, and this is, I'm not pointing the finger at Blaze because this is a this is a national issue, particularly within uh, the women's game. Um, so are there programmes out there which, which are encouraging participation amongst uh, sort of different ethnic communities? Yes, yeah, so if you look at um, Nottinghamshire, uh, who obviously host the Blaze, they've, they've got an ACE programme um, that's moving forwards now. And, you know, that's brilliant. We've obviously got Amy Wheeler, who, who is part of an ACE programme. For me, it's, it's really important that we do lock into, I guess, representation and being representative of the region. And a lot of that is the work that the community sides do with within counties. So there's a lot of like community cha talent champions. I know Leicestershire have two um, talent champions who go out and they, they look in schools for, for potential talent. And, you know, I guess coming back to my roots of working within Bedfordshire, um, Luton was like a massive one for us. It, it was eye-opening because I was working, my role was community and performance coach. So I was working in schools in Luton and doing some work within some like really deprived areas. And there'd be some players that you just think, oh, you're just unbelievable. You've just got an absolute knack for it. And I'll give you, I'll give you an example. There was there was two girls who were at one school in, in Luton and I had tried so hard to find you know grants and bursaries. And at the time, there was there was barely anything available, so it was 
resorting to almost linking parents up together and saying, oh, you know, do you two know each other and can can we get this player to this training hub and, and what that looks like? I think like breaking down those barriers was was really important. But now you look at, I guess, the entry to performance pathways and county age group stuff, you know, the costs are coming down. I don't think Leicestershire pay any costs. There's nobody in the blaze pays costs. So the barriers aren't there for us. And I guess it's, like you say, it's really important at, at the infancy of, can we just get players in? And I think like getting as many players in as possible is, is the key for us. And like I say, we we cherry pick and we're we're lucky in that sense. And you know, we get to do that. But the real good hard work is is coming from the county boards and the schools and the clubs that are putting on all these great you know programs and and different things structures that that are going to pay dividends for us in in the end. And you know, we've kind of got to allow those guys to go and do the great work that they do, um, and trust that they're doing the bits that are going to going to provide future cricketers. And like you say, with within just Leicestershire and, and Nottinghamshire there is there is a great proportion of players there that I think are, are untapped um, and, and we need to get into those communities a lot more. And we'll briefly touch on the Blaze to finish. Now uh, the Blaze moved to Trent Bridge last year. What was that whole move like? Because it seems to be that it's made all the difference because Lightning previously didn't win, win many games and then the Blaze have been fantastic throughout 2023. Uh, it's the orange kit. <laughs> um anyone who wears orange wins stuff in the women's game apparently no I, I, it was turbulent uh <laughs> so it was quite funny actually so i i started this role in april of 2022 and our director james cut um started just before me and he knew all of the information about the move uh, but couldn't tell anybody so i'd um i'd start <laughs> i'd start looking for houses and um sort of somewhere to rent up here Every week he'd sort of like be badgering me on the phone and he'd, oh, have you found anywhere yet? And I'd say, uh, not yet. And he said, oh, you know, just, just let me know when you find somewhere. And it was almost, you know, oh, he really cares about me. He really cares about what's going on. <laughs> and I said, I found somewhere near Loughborough. He was like, oh, are you, are you sure? Are you sure Loughborough's right? And I was just thinking like, what, what's going on here? Um, and he obviously knew this this inside information. Um, so I moved up and live near Loughborough now. Um, and then I think it was a couple of weeks after I moved in in August, he uh, he dropped the bombshell that we were we were headed up to to Trent Bridge and that you know the tender process had gone through. But I think that the difference, obviously, Loughborough is a, a ridiculous facility. We were there today training with with the pro side, and you get given everything. You know, there's a it's the National Performance Centre. You can do whatever you want in there. Um, and, you know, there's, diff- there's different perks to it, but I think the feel of being around a cricket place is, is different. And, and Trent Bridge, I think the, they've been so welcoming. You know, the, the guys on the gate and um, you just walk past and they're always smiling at you. And it's, you know, it's infectious. And you know, Trent Bridge and Nottinghamshire pride themselves on being friendly and being welcoming and, you know, you definitely get that feel there. But I think within that, there was a shift. Um, and I know that, obviously, Guesty did a lot of really good culture work with, within the pro environment. And I think a lot of that's sort of dripped into into the pathway. And to be honest, it's really easy to motivate pathway players when, when the pro side's winning because, you know, the standards have to improve. If you, if you want to move to that level, you need to get better. And I think that 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 was really important for us last year was in the pathway to to have the results on the field for the pro side and it almost created that sense of everyone's moving towards the same direction but I'll be honest there's a, there's a hell of a lot of hard work that goes on behind the scenes um, HR won't like some of the hours that we work but uh, I think people people go above and beyond provide for players provide for each other and there is that adaptability of sometimes we think well maybe we're not going to meet this deadline but you know I think some, some, somehow it, it always manages to work out. And I think that comes down to the, the hard work that the guys are putting in behind the scenes. It sounds like a really good culture. We were actually there um, on the, the first game at, at Trent Bridge that, that Blaze played. So sort of saw the birth of this new team, if you if you like, uh, against Sparks, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and that was a, I mean, that was a really good game and, and actually set the tone for the season, didn't it? In, in a dominant performance that day. But am I right in saying that he didn't get to play very much at Trent Bridge last season? No, the pro side didn't. Um, and I'll be honest, I think a lot of that's intentional. Uh, we want, whilst we, we have moved as 
Nottinghamshire being our host, I think we're really keen to remain a regional program. Um, and understanding that whilst we're hosted in one place, whilst we're a regional program, it's important to represent all four counties within the region and, and make sure that those guys are represented. It, it, you know, we go back to how do we engage players in different communities? Well, we've, we've got to go to different places. We can't just set out one stand and, you know, this is our castle, our fortress, and we're going to play everything here because, you know, how do we open up to school kids in, in Derbyshire? How do we open up to school kids in Leicestershire? And, you know, the that diversifying of where we play games, I think, is really crucial of, of engaging young kids. Um, I think, you know, you say about that game, how many school kids there were in the stands and sort of filtering in and out, you know, the, you see them all chanting in the corner, it was brilliant. Um, and I think just being able to do that in, in each of the different counties, definitely for us, is, is a key marker of success. And I know James, um, James has made a real push for that. And I have to say that's something that's really close to him um, of, of engaging the whole region. So he's done a he's done a brilliant job there. Yes, in fact, I remember you did something very clever that day, didn't you? Because you organised a big meeting for everyone on the same day as the game. Mm. And so the, the ground was yeah. just full of people who were there for that meeting who also got mm. to see the game. I thought that was a smart bit of marketing, that was. Yeah, yeah we tried our best. I think we had some, some technical difficulties with the microphone that day. So I um, had to raise our voices, probably being, being the same boat as you, of losing your voice at the end of the, <laughs> end of the day. So, yeah, it's... Um, it, I think that, like you say, that was kind of the, the start of the line in the sand for us. Of we're here to play cricket and we're here to we're here to compete with people, and you know we we definitely did that. And the coaches can only go so far, and backroom staff can only go so far. It's got to be a point where the players put that product onto the pitch, and you know, they did that brilliantly last season. I think it's it's going to be it's going to be an exciting one this year, and you know, we'll see we'll see where the Blaze get to. Well, having got to two finals, it, it, the next step is the obvious one, isn't it? Silverware. Mm. Uh, so I think it's going to be a really, really big season. But every year, of course, the standards just go up everywhere. So it's, it's staying as good as you were probably isn't going to be good enough, is it? You've got to be looking to improve all the time. It's it's hard because I think, obviously, we're in sport, you have a different sort of dilemma wherever you are. So if you're a... If you're a team that's winning trophies constantly you've got a target on your back whereas when you're chasing that point you almost know what success looks like so you know how to play the game to, to get success all the stats get spit out you know score this in the power play take this many wickets and it tells you what success looks like but you know the the, the best sides adapt and, and continue evolving as time goes on and you know that target on your back that's where we want to be we want to have the target on our back and look at well actually how can we keep evolving and how can we keep pushing forwards? And I guess from 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 my perspective, from an academy point of view, it's how can we keep doing that? You know, we we had a great season last year and and, and did really well, but it's not rest on our laurels. You know, there's we win a couple of games in the pathway. You know, no one's getting contracts from that, and, and winning for us isn't isn't as important within the academy space. But how can we keep evolving players to go in and make it instant impacts within within pro cricket? So I guess. You know that that's kind of forming a lot of a lot of our our belief structure and how how we integrate players. We had a great crossover session yesterday. Yesterday, yeah, yesterday. So we had the pros in the academy were all together, you know, learning from each other, and I guess some of the some of the staff members from from the pro environment were saying some of these academy girls just, they come out and they just they try and hit it so hard, and I guess we've worked really hard to get them to that point. And they'll obviously come a point where that comes a little bit unstuck, but you know that's not for us to tell them they're gonna they're gonna figure that out and, and and work through that and ultimately we want to play a positive brand of cricket that has to start within within the pathway so yeah i think we're we're moving in a in a strong direction thank you so much it's been brilliant uh, to talk to you giving us real insight into what it's like behind the scenes in their pro cricket environment no it's been brilliant you asked some really good questions as well like definitely made me think and, and reflect on a few bits that i'll have to go and go and take away and, and sit on and, and think over over the break That's brilliant well good. do have a have a really good break mm -hmm. have a enjoy your christmas and uh and i hope blaze come back really roaring strong in 2024 yeah well, we've just had gordo come back in so we'll definitely be fiery in the new year <laughs> <laughs>
I thought Kane was great. Yeah. I thought he was so thoughtful and mm. reflective mm -hmm. and really represented the women's game really yeah. well in, in the way that he spoke. Yeah, it was really interesting. And I've listened to it about four times now whilst editing it because I must, well, I will say this actually. Um, we're using a new editor, what we, we, off. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, I, I recommended it. I think it was no, fine no, no, for no, it. you did not. <laughs> I'm using a new editing software, so I'm just getting used to it. It's better than the one we're using before. So hopefully there should be no family Zoom calls, no major skips, anything <laughs> like that. <laughs> it should go smoothly now. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've listened to it a lot. But, no, it, it was really, really fascinating to, as we mentioned, get that insight into kind of the other side of it. But then also some of the things about having to let people know that, you know, we're dropping you. Yeah. Um, and they're very difficult conversations to have with people like I mean people my age and younger mm -hmm. like, imagine being told yeah you're not good enough and th that's hard when particularly with a sport like cricket you've spent I mean I imagine a lot of these people have been playing since they were 9, 10, 11 some even younger and then perhaps you have this career plan in mind and someone says no and to me, it makes me think that that tier below the professional level mm. needs developing further. The yeah. county game needs well, exactly. proper development so yeah. it can, you know, play more than, you know, three or four games mm. in, in the pre-season period yeah. and actually be a place where people can drop down to yeah. and actually play themselves into form and, and get to the position where they can go back into the professional game. Yeah. And I guess it also reveals how much work, I think well, for a Blaze example, people like Josie Groves have put in over the last few years to work really hard in the academy and then become an undroppable part of the senior side. Um, and that takes so much work as, as Kane spoke about. So yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, we won't be back next week. We'll be back in a couple of weeks time with another guest and wrapping up the year. So is there a special Christmas message you'd like to give to our listeners? Oh, I mean, if you, if I could have prepared something. No, no, no just, just um, spontaneous. <laughs> oh, what's the one they use in Muffet Christmas Carol? It's like, <laughs> um, thank you all, and Merry Christmas. And it's like, that was short. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> That's my speech. Thank you all, and Merry Christmas. Yes, thank you all, and Merry Christmas.